Uh, great to have you here. It's, uh, you're the hardy one. Came out in Fort Green weather to come to church, so thank you. It is cold out. Um, today is a kind of a special celebration. Every Sunday is a special celebration. Am I on? we have in, in the church is we reaffirm our baptismal covenant for that celebration today. So that's what this is all about. So right as, after the sermon, we'll roll, roll right into this, this reaffirmation of our baptismal covenant. We won't be coming forward, but, but we'll be saying the vows together, which will be on the screen behind me. So we'll be using our screen for that. So that's why y'all need to be in there. We love Um I do have a couple announcements though before we get to that. Um, our construction update, um, as promised, we're gonna let you know which bathrooms happen to be open this morning. And it's the two bathrooms downstairs. Again, are open. These two up here are not quite bathrooms yet. Uh, but I will tell you on our, on our remodeling effort, you know, you kind of go through two big phases when you remodel something. First, you gotta tear everything up. And then you transition to the rebuilding phase. And we are right, I think AB, we're right on the cusp of done tearing stuff up and now we're starting to build stuff back. So it's, it's getting there. They made a lot of progress last week. Um, it's a little dusty down there though, so just beware. All the, all the drywalling that's going on and sanding and all that stuff. That's the way it is. But, um, but they made some progress and uh, I'm so thankful for that. And all this is made possible because of your generosity. Um, so thank you. We're getting there. This too shall pass. Just be patient and we'll, we'll be back. The place will be back better than ever. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce is our, our dementia caregivers ministry is postponed. It, it normally meets this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We're postponing. Pastor Charles is postponing that due to the four degrees outside. So um, I don't think he's got a date set for that yet, but, but we won't be having it tonight. <coughs> Um, also, I want to call your attention to uh, the radio broadcast. It was provided by Ophelia Williamson, a remembrance of Bob passing one year ago. Um, so, so thank you, Ophelia, for that. I think that's all the announcements I have, except Steve Green has an announcement. Steve, come on up. Thank you, Pastor. Kenny and I will be starting a, uh, another, or I should say a new, Sunday school program and a new and additional Sunday school program because there's other Sunday school programs going on also. But anyway, the format of our, our Sunday school class will be that we will show a short video, about 20 minutes, and afterward we will discuss that video. We'll discuss the lesson in it and how it might apply to us. Um, this, this series that we're starting is a series taught by Matt Tito, and it's called In the Footsteps of the Savior, and it's actually taught in the Holy Land, in places where Jesus was. And so it kind of brings it home to you that you can see the surroundings of what could have been uh, the same as what Jesus saw. And uh, it takes place, the first lesson will be in Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee, and that was an important city for our Jesus because that is where he, he called Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew to follow him. So today or any, any Sunday, go by and get you a cup of coffee, come up to room 302 upstairs, and let's watch a video and discuss how it may apply to our lives. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Penny, for taking leadership on that. And now, if you'll please stand and we'll begin our worship service, please stand for intro and your opening prayer. <laughs>
fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. And as we pray together today, may the Holy Spirit lead us in all we do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the privilege of worship. And as we gather here in this beautiful place with your people, we invoke your blessings and guidance upon all we do in the name of our Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us turn in our hymn book, hymn number 1484. <coughs> Remembering 
the actual event that they want us to do. They want us to remember what it means, right? And what baptism means is we are a child of God. We are washed of our sins. And when we're obedient, we haven't done a lot of sinning yet, but it'll come, right? Because we're human. And so all we have to do is when we're in a hard situation or we have to make a really hard decision, if we just say a quick prayer to God and we remember that we are a baptized child of him and he loves us no matter what, all the time, and he has a he has he has created us for something, right? If we remember that, it makes all the hard stuff a lot easier, doesn't it? Will you guys pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you. Thank you. For my baptism. For my baptism. Please help me. Please help me. Remember. Remember. And become who you want me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, I know you guys know that the best rememberers are smarty pants like you guys. So, I want you to take some smarties today because you're gonna get you because you're gonna it's gonna help you remember. <laughs> This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all of the people of Jerusalem, went to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth into Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens split apart and the Holy Spirit descending down upon him like a dove and a voice from heaven said you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy this is the word of god for the people of god Thank you. Thank you.
that one was a keeper, Sheila. <laughs> I like that. That's, that's nice of you. Well, as I mentioned at the top, today uh, we're going to observe yet another one of, of the church's traditional liturgical celebration, and that is the commemoration of the baptism of our Lord. Now, last week was the Epiphany of the Lord, and today is the baptism of the Lord. And you know, what a great way to start the year if you think about it. Just as Jesus began his earthly ministry with his baptism in the waters of the Jordan, you and I have the opportunity to, to re-begin our earthly ministry um, as Jesus' disciples by re-remembering our own baptismal covenant. Or if you haven't been baptized, then, you know, consider our scripture reading and consider, consider this message as, a, as an invitation. You know, having said that, this is a, this is a very special Sunday, but having said that, from a, from a sermon writing perspective, um, not that anybody would care, but, but this, is, this is one of the more challenging Sundays, at least it is for me, and let me explain what I mean by that. You know, John, or Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, that's one of the few events that made its way into all four of the Gospels. Details vary, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all provide the same basic description. But no matter which gospel is read, and no matter which Bible translation is read from, the baptism of Jesus it seems to always generate more questions than it does answers. I'm talking theological questions. For instance, the fourth verse that that we read says that John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, if that's the case, why does Jesus come to be baptized by John? Was Jesus somehow under the, the power of sin prior to his baptism in the Jordan? Or was his baptism really a sign of his solidarity with, with us members of the sinful human race? Theological question. Well, how about this one? Does the voice that, that calls Jesus son and beloved simply announce what, what has always been true? Or does God the Father's declaration from on high, does that imply a kind of adoption? Jesus came to the, to the Jordan's waters to have his sins washed away. If Jesus didn't really become the Son of God until he was adopted at the Jordan River, then why do we celebrate Christmas as the coming of Emmanuel, God with us? If Jesus didn't come to have his sins washed away, what was his baptism for? And what then is the purpose of our baptism? Now those are just some of the theological questions that Jesus' baptism tends to generate. And therefore, that's what a sermon on, on baptism should, should probably attempt to address. And that's why from a, from a preaching, from a homiletical perspective, I find this particular text kind of challenging. How can you possibly address those very valid questions in an 18 to 20 minute sermon? And still make it to South Campus on time. <laughs> But those are good and valid questions. But we should, we should never make any apologies for asking questions like that. Just look at it this way. You know, God's word is infinite. And our brains are finite. And any time we open our finite brains up to God's infinite wisdom, we are bound to come away with questions. And if we don't, then, just to put it bluntly, we're probably not trying hard enough. We're probably exercising a blind, somewhat lazy faith. And in my opinion, a blind and lazy faith isn't really much of a faith at all. So if these are some of your questions, then keep on asking. And as a matter of fact, you're going to have to keep on asking because this sermon probably won't address any of those questions that I just read. In fact, rather than delve into those aforementioned theological questions, I'd like for us to simply follow, follow the gospel writer's lead. And again, it's not that these questions aren't worth asking. It's just that for the purposes of this morning and, and from what I think Mark is trying to convey to us, 
those questions, they just they kind of miss the miss the point. You know, it's worth noting that, that Mark's gospel doesn't begin with Jesus' genealogy, nor does it begin with, with Jesus' birth there. He leaves that to Matthew and Luke. Nor does Mark begin with an in the beginning was the word type in intro. He leaves that cosmic wonder, otherworldliness language, he leaves that to John. Instead, Mark, the, the consummate pragmatist, he kicks off his gospel with a simple down-to-earth statement. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's it. That's his thesis statement. Now don't get me wrong, Mark's plain language, his, his matter-of-fact beginning, in no way means that he considers Matthew and Luke's Christmas narrative, Christmas narrative or, or John's cosmic wonder beginning. He doesn't consider them to be unnecessary. It just means that his audience and therefore his perspective were different than the other gospel writers. See, Mark's gospel was, was primarily written to a Roman Christian audience. And Mark knew that the telling about Jesus' birth would have, would have meant little to a Roman audience. So leaving all, leaving that to the other gospel writers, Mark skips the angel's announcement, and he skips the manger scene, and basically skips the first 30 years of Jesus' life, and he starts his gospel with John the Baptist. Now, why would he begin with a gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would he begin it with John the Baptist rather than beginning it with Jesus? Well, because in the Roman culture, Important officials were always preceded by an announcer, always preceded by a herald, a person whose job it was to announce that somebody really important was coming. Therefore, given his audience, it was totally appropriate that Mark began the good news of Jesus Christ, not with Jesus, but with the one whose job it was to announce Jesus' is coming. So leaving all those theological questions aside, Mark's telling of Jesus' baptism it revolves really just around two very simple things. Profound things, but simple things. It revolves around John the Baptist, number one, and it revolves around God tearing open the heavens. It revolves around John the Baptist, and it revolves around God tearing open the heavens. Now first, let's look at, let's look at John the Baptist. It doesn't take a, a theology degree to pick up on the fact that this guy, John the Baptist, is kind of out there. The clothes he wore, the food he ate, the wilderness that he called home, um, he was kind of in a class of his own. And I'm sure you've heard many a sermon and many a Sunday school lesson that focused on John's eccentric behavior and his, and his odd fashion sense and his gross eating habits. But have you ever thought much about why God portrays him that way? Have you ever thought much about why John the Baptist comes off as being so weird so radical. He was weird radical to us, but he was even weird radical back in the day. Well, here's a thought. Maybe it's because John's role wasn't to fit in, but rather to serve as a connective tissue. John was to serve as a connective tissue between the Old and the New Testament. And if that's the case, John's clothes, his, his attire, they weren't out of style, they were just kind of retro. You see, John was the, he was the new Elijah who's coming to mark the arrival of a new era, the beginning of a, of a new day. And his appearance in the wilderness, it recalls Israel's wilderness wanderings between the deliverance, their deliverance from slavery in Egypt and their entry into the promised land. And John isn't, isn't doing his thing out in the wilderness for, for some sort of theatrical effect way too deep for that. John is in the wilderness baptizing people in the Jordan River because that's the place in God's word that marks the border between the wilderness of our sin and the promised land of our salvation. That's why it's at the Jordan River. John stands right on the edge of the reign of God and invites people to begin now living into that reality. He stands at the door and he tells people to prepare the new day that's coming. And with all this, with the subtlety of a two by four to the forehead, John announces that God is coming to you. Repent, turn around, leave the wilderness of your sin and death behind. Receive the baptism 
of repentance. He says, because someone is coming who is greater than I. He says, I'll baptize you with water. But he who's coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit of God. That's the good news that John the Baptist was preparing people to receive. Think about it. If you were one of those hundreds, maybe thousands of people who heard John's rantings in the, out in the desert, would you have gotten it? Would you have understood it? Would you have picked up on the significance of his, of his meaning and what he was trying to get at? I'm not sure I would. Actually, who could? Who could imagine what was going to come next? And what came next was Jesus' appearance on the scene. Now notice that, that Jesus doesn't say anything. Other than just showing up, he's rather kind of inactive throughout this whole story, isn't he? He didn't have any speaking part. But Jesus arrives on the scene in, in verse 9 of what, what Sherry read. It says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Gal Galilee and was baptized by John in Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn open, torn apart, and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. Just imagine that scene. As Jesus arrives, he's out of the waters of the Jordan. He sees the heavens torn apart. And through that tear, in the fabric of creation, the Spirit of God and the voice of God, they invade the wilderness of our existence. At the moment of Jesus' baptism, heaven and earth are suddenly transparent to one another. And in my mind's eye, I picture Jesus standing there in the dirty backwater of our sin, looking up into heaven and hearing the voice of his father calling out to him in love, saying, you are my son, the beloved, and with you I am well pleased. And at that instant, all of creation is caught up in the love between the father and the son. And that instant, God invaded the wilderness of our sin with his good news. In that instant, God tore open the curtain that separated us from his love. At that very instant in time, God provided his wilderness people with a, with a way to live into, a way to participate in the love that exists between the Father and the Son. At that instant, God provided you and me a bridge, a bridge from the wilderness of our sin to the promised land of, of a loving relationship with our Father through His Son. That was Jesus' baptism. But what about yours? What about yours? Have you ever thought of your own baptism in those terms? You know, it seems to me that we Christians, we spend so much time arguing and disagreeing about what baptism is and what it means and how long you have to be to receive it. How wet you got to get for it to take effect, that, that we miss out on the significance of the whole thing. What a shame. You know, because when it's all said and done, does any of that stuff really matter? It doesn't seem to matter to Mark, our gospel writer. But here's what does matter to each and every one of us. In those days, Brian was three weeks old and was baptized in St. Benedict's Catholic Church. And just as he was coming out of the water, the heavens were torn apart and the spirit descended like a dove on him. And God said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. In those days, Chelsea came from Jackson. She was 38 years old and she was baptized at Lumen Cantor United Methodist Church. And just as she was coming out of the water, the heavens were torn apart and the spirit descended like a dove on her. And God said, this is my daughter with whom I am well pleased. In those days, Ryan came from Newark, New Jersey. He was 12 years old, was baptized at the First Baptist Church. And just as he was coming out of the water, the heavens were torn apart, and the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And God said, this is my son, whom I am well pleased. Never mind the other stuff you get all wrapped up in. When you were baptized, God tore the heavens apart just for you, and claimed you, and accepted you as his own. God reached into the wilderness of your world and claimed you, saying, you are mine, I love you, no matter what. And that's what today is all about. 
It's about reclaiming. It's about re-remembering that moment in our lives. It's about preparing ourselves not to be rebaptized. God got it right the first time. We don't need to be rebaptized. But to remember that God tore open the heavens just for you. You are his beloved. This is a time to, to re-accept God's acceptance of you. Now, in just a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to, to remember our baptism and, and a reaffirmation that, that God has claimed us as his, as his own son and daughter. Now, if you've not been baptized, please know that you're, you're fully welcome here, obviously. And just enjoy the ritual. Feel free to say the words or not say the words as they apply to you. And if you'd like to know more about being part of this baptismal covenant and about this life of discipleship, I hope you please come and speak with me. And I welcome the opportunity to take that journey with you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, God's Spirit has been poured out upon water. Water poured over and immersing us. Water that flows freely for all who will receive it. Water from the streams of God's saving power and justice. Water that brings hope to all who thirst for righteousness. Water that refreshes life, nurtures growth, and offers new birth. Today we come to the waters to renew our commitment to Christ who has raised us, the Spirit who has birthed us, and the Creator who is making all things new. And so I ask you, will you turn away from the powers of sin and death? Will you let the Spirit use you as prophets through the powers of this age? the good news and live as disciples of Jesus Christ and his body on earth. We confess in Jesus Christ as our Savior, put our full trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as our Lord, in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Will you be living witnesses to the gospel, individually and together, wherever you are and all that you do? faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. We affirm the teaching of faith of the whole church as we put our trust in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, His only Son, and in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Spirit of the Lord is with us. Let us pray. Almighty God, the life you birthed in us by baptism into Jesus Christ will never die. Your justice never fails. Your mercy is everlasting. But sometimes we try. We try to block the flow. We redirect the winds of the Spirit. Or we walk so far away from the life of the stream that we do not hear its sound and we forget its power. We parch ourselves. We are dry and thirsty, O oh God. Come upon us, Holy Spirit, and refresh us. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters remind us of your righteousness and justice. Let these waters renew us in the resurrection power of Jesus. Let these waters make us long for your
God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now let's stand and join in singing number 400, which is Come Thou Fond of Every Blessing. <laughs> special day of remembering our baptism. We gather here to remember who we are and who you are. Once we were nobodies. Once we were wandering pilgrims. Once we were without a home. Once we were without acknowledging the Holy Spirit as leader and guide of our lives. But today, because of the symbol of baptism, we gather here as your people, acknowledging your love, that you cared so much for each one of us, that you gave yourself through Jesus Christ on the cross, we might have life and have it abundantly. So today we're humble with the service of remembering our baptism. We're reminded again of the importance of that commitment was made, whether we made by our parents as a child or whether it was made as adults, we know this is a very important decision and certainly gives us the assurance that we're not alone. The curtain was lifted, now we're part of your family, and we know that nothing can happen to any of us but what you promised to be with us. Lord, as we pray, we remember these precious ones on our prayer list. You know every day. You know their need better than we know. We only know that we care and we pray that your will will be done. 
done in their lives to bring healing and wholeness and new beginning. And what we ask for each one of these, we ask for all today that are going to be accomplished. May your Holy Spirit give us strength and guidance and reassure us to know we're never alone. We're always in your presence and your, under your guidance. It's because of your love for us. We can lift our prayers together, praying the prayer you taught us to pray, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.
God to make the command visible. Leave this place, we leave knowing as a people of God, it's our responsibility to share the good news with others. As we go, we're not alone. We go in the presence of the God who is with us. I go in peace and may the blessing of the Lord be our strength and guide today. And always, all of God's people together, said amen. 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 amen.